Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson. In this video we're going to talk about the properties of determinants. So in the last class we introduced what a determinant was and how to calculate two by, the determinant of 2 by 2 matrices and also larger matrices as well. And now we want to focus on the properties of these determinants. We'll start, we'll start by comparing it to our process of row reduction. We saw earlier that row operations do not change the solution set of a system. This allowed us to do row reduction on a matrix and get a simpler matrix which had the same solution set. However, row operations do change the value of the determinant, but they change it in predictable ways. So specifically, let A be a square matrix, and if we add multiple rows together inside of that matrix A, we do not change the determinant of A. However, number two says that if we interchange rows, do that row operation, we will change the sign of the determinant. And the third one says if we multiply a row by k, some constant value k, this changes the determinant by a factor of k. So now let's look at some examples of these properties. So here I have some matrix A, and I want to calculate the determinant of A. So using the formula, I will expand down the first row and say this is 0 times a subdeterminant where I eliminate the first row and first column and get this little subdeterminant, minus 1 times the subdeterminant 1, 3, 1, 5, plus 0 times some other subdeterminant, 1, 2, 1, 2, but this turns out to be 0, and this turns out to be 0, and then I have negative 1 times 5 minus 3. Altogether I get a value of negative 2. So it looks like the determinant of A is equal to negative 2. So now I look at my next determinant value. I want to find the determinant of this matrix. But when I see that the only difference between these two matrices is that I have interchanged row 1 and row 2, that tells me that this determinant should be equal to 2. Because when I interchange a row, I change the sign of the determinant. Then I go to the next matrix. This matrix looks just like my starting matrix A, except that I've multiplied the first row by a value of 4. So this tells me the determinant and I should use that straight notation over here, the determinant of this matrix should be 4 times the determinant of A. So in this case, that would be negative 8. And then I look at the last one. This matrix inside of this determinant, this matrix looks like my matrix A, except that I've added row 2 to row 1. And so this determinant should be exactly the same as the determinant of A because adding multiples of rows to each other does not change the value of the determinant. So in this case, my determinant would be negative 2. Let's look at one more example. This is the determinant of 3 times the matrix A. Now, if I look at this determinant, I know how to multiply A by the scalar factor of 3. It just tells me that I multiply each of the elements of A by 3, like this. And so I can think of this as multiplying each of the rows of A by 3. And each time I multiply one row by 3, this changes the determinant by a factor of 3. So in this case, the final result would be taking 3 to the third power times my determinant of A. So in this case, I would get a value of 27 times the determinant of A, or a negative 54. Now in general, if I have some matrix B, that is a n by n matrix, so it's in the set of all n by n matrices, then if I had the determinant of k times b, the result would be k raised to the n power times the determinant of b. So I've seen an example of this in the previous case, and this is the more general property. Now let's look at some other properties. So here are three more properties, and I just kind of want to walk through each one and maybe heuristically justify them and then do an example. We'll start off with the first one. The determinant of A transpose is equal to the determinant of A. So I'm not going to necessarily prove this property. I'm going to show you an example with a 3 by 3 that should help kind of justify. Let's look at A equal to this matrix. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Not a very creative matrix. Now we'll take the determinant of A, and we'll start to write out what this thing looks like. It looks like 1 times the determinant 5, 6, 8, 9 minus 2 times the determinant of 4, 6, 7, 9. So this is the expansion along the first row of A. Now if I write out what A transpose is, it should look like this.
Now if I want to calculate the determinant of A transpose, I'm going to expand down the first column. And when I expand down the first column, I will get this. Now when I compare these two values, I can see the only difference is in these diagonal terms here, these off diagonal terms. And the only difference is those are swapped in their position. But since when I go to evaluate any one of these determinants, I'll just take that strong diagonal product, so 5 times 9 minus 6 times 8 in this case, but it doesn't really matter which order I multiply the 6 and the 8 because it's just regular multiplication, which is commutative. So because of that, all these terms will end up being the same. And so I can see that the determinant of A will be the same thing as the determinant of A transpose. Once again, the big idea here is that because I can expand on any row or column, expanding on the first row of A is very similar to expanding on the first column of A transpose. The result is going to be the same. Now let's look at the next property. We have the determinant of the product of two matrices, AB, is equal to the product of the determinants, the determinant of A times the determinant of B. And while we're not going to go through the proof of this, we will talk about some of the implications of this. We'll talk about two in particular. This helps us to explain how the determinant is affected by row operations. Because if we can think of row operations as multiplication by elementary matrices, then now we could look at the determinant of the product of those two matrices as the determinant of the result of the row operation. Let's look at something specific. If I have a matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, if I want to calculate the determinant, I can certainly calculate that. But if I wanted to multiply the first row by 3, for instance, well, that's the same thing as multiplying it by this matrix. But now the determinant of this product, using this property, is just the determinant of that first matrix, 3, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, times the determinant of my other matrix, which I'll just call A now. But because this elementary matrix is so nice, and it's upper triangular, in fact, it's diagonal, Calculating the determinant is very easy. It's just the product of the diagonal entries, which in this case means it's 3 times the determinant of A. So using this property helps me justify why multiplying a row by a constant has the effect of multiplying the determinant by the constant. So that's one thing we're going to see with this property. Another thing we want to look at is how we can use this property to calculate the determinant of powers. So for instance, if the determinant of A is equal to 3, then the determinant of A raised to the fifth power is equal to what? And now we'll think about it. Now we'll talk about this as the determinant of A times A times A times A times A. But using this property, this is the same thing as the determinant of A times the determinant of A five times. And each one of those has a value of 3. So now we can see that this is really 3 to the fifth power. So we can use this property to justify the determinant of powers. And the last one we want to talk about is the fact that, the deter that A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to 0. And this is a very important property. We already saw this property for 2 by 2. That's how we got that expression for the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. It was designed because it was the value that would determine whether or not the inverse would exist. But not only will it tell us that the matrix is invertible, but it will also help us to find the determinant of A inverse. It says that if the determinant is not equal to 0, then the determinant of A inverse will exist, and specifically it's equal to 1 over the determinant of A. So why is it this specific value? Well, let's talk about what it means to be invertible. Since A is invertible, there exists some inverse matrix, and I can write A times A inverse is equal to the identity matrix. But these two matrices are equal, A times A inverse and the identity, therefore their determinant should be equal. So I should be able to say that the determinant of A times A inverse is equal to the determinant of the identity matrix. And now I can use that previous property and rewrite the left-hand side as the determinant of A times the determinant of A inverse. And I can actually calculate that term on the right-hand side, because this is just a diagonal matrix with all ones on the diagonal. Then the determinant of the identity matrix is just the number 1. 
And because the determinant of A is just a number, remember the determinant is something that takes this matrix and it gives it a number value, I can divide by that number. And so the result will be the determinant of A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A. Once again, I can't stress enough that I can do that division because the determinant of A is a matrix. Too often we see students try to divide by a matrix, and you cannot do that. We don't have that operation defined. All right, so we've covered some of the main properties of the determinant, and that will conclude this video. Thank you.